today, my name is Rick Kennedy. I'm a PA. I work at the Center for Vascular Medicine in Greenbelt, Maryland. And today I want to talk about uh, pelvic venous disorders and something called pelvic congestion syndrome. I want to start by, of course, uh, as, as we always do, <clears throat> we want to start with anatomy. And so we'll start by talking about the ovarian vein anatomy. The uh, ovarian veins, both the left and right, uh, are there to provide drainage of the parametrium, the cervix, the mesosalpinx, the, and the pampiniform plexus. There are uh, two to three trunks that form a single vein, roughly at the level of uh, L4. And uh, the mean diameter is typically about three, three to five millimeters. The, the ovarian veins, and, and really thinking about the deep vein system, have minimal valves uh, different than the superficial system. So the typical ovarian vein is, is going to have two to three valves. And we actually see asymptomatic valvular incompetence in the ovarian vein in roughly about 47% of women. So this is a little bit different view. I like this one a little bit better. And again, just to review anatomy. So this is the IVC. This is the right common iliac vein, the left common iliac vein. This is the left renal vein, which gives rise to the left ovarian vein. And as you can see, uh, connects and drains uh, the periuterine vein. So this is the uterus, and this is the uh, venous drainage coming out into the left ovarian vein, and this is the right ovarian vein. This is the same uh, structure, but of course this is venography. And so again, we see the uh, left ovarian vein here, which uh, appear, we don't have a measurement, but uh, appears visually to be quite large and refluxing. And you see, uh, of course, this is, uh, this is iodized dye. We see a large amount of dye pooling around the uterus. This is the, the area of the uterus. And we see all this periuterine uh, uh, venous uh, structures that are draining uh, the uterine structure but again, this is a significant amount of reflux. Um, so rather than draining, actually it's pooling around the uterus. So <clears throat> this idea of pelvic congestion syndrome, when we talk about primary pelvic congestion syndrome and its pathogenesis, we start talking about et uh, endocrine factors. So thinking about the hormonal cycle for our female patients, estrogen clearly plays an important role. And in the presence of estrogen, we have increased nitrous oxide, which of course leads to smooth muscle relaxation, and progesterone, which also uh, leads to reduction in venous tone. When we have our female patients that have had uh, pregnancies, uh, this can cause mechanical obstruction in the pelvis. And so during pregnancy, we know that there is significantly increased vas vascularity. It's estimated that it can be as much as 60 times increased flow. So with that a gravid uterus sitting on top of the IVC and the common iliac veins, you can see significant compression. And so all of these factors together, the compression of the IVC and the common iliac vein, along with increased flow and the endocrinological factors of smooth muscle relaxation and reduction in venous tone, that leads to ovarian vein and periuterine vein dilation, uh, which can lead to reflux and the uh, dysfunction of the valves, which then ultimately leads to these pelvic varicosities, which we just saw nicely highlighted in the venogram. Secondary pelvic congestion syndrome, uh, also known as May Thurner syndrome, uh, is more of an obstructive uh, cause for this venous hypertension in the pelvis. And so again, as we, as we think back to our training, uh, most of us learned a little bit about May Thurner syndrome, uh, but probably with regard to DVT and not really with regard to its role in secondary pelvic congestion syndrome. And so again, a little bit of an anatomy review. This is the aorta. And as it comes, uh, the right common iliac artery courses uh, across, and this is the left common iliac artery, and you can see as the right common iliac artery courses across, this is the IVC and the left common iliac vein, you can see the artery compresses the vein, 
and causes in some patients roughly about 30 percent of the population according to the original uh, study that was done by Dr. May and Dr. Therner uh, after World War II. Uh, this idea of a compression uh, which we now know as may Therner syndrome uh, occurs here at the left common iliac vein as the right common iliac artery compresses it. So as is always the case, when we are presented with a patient uh, who has chronic pelvic pain, we need to consider differential diagnoses and, and ensure that none of these are the cause for the pain uh, before proceeding down a, a vascular pathway. There are gynecologic causes, which we're all probably pretty familiar with in the form of endometriosis as well as fibroids. Of course, PID, uh, typically not as common. The symptoms end up being more acute. Ovarian cysts, adhesions, particularly from past abdominal and, and pelvic surgeries, prolapsed uterus. In the urological realm, interstitial cystitis, recurrent UTI. From a GI perspective, many patients come to us with a diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome, which again, a diagnosis of exclusion. Many times patients are placed in this, in this category um, just because we, we don't know what else is going on. From a hematological standpoint, we always want to make sure we rule out any extrinsic causes of compression in the pelvis, be it cancer. Um, many times the, the groin pain or pelvic pain can be associated with uh, the SI joint or other hip joint pathology. Fibromyalgia, of course, is something we should always consider when we, when we talk about chronic pain. From a muscular skeletal perspective, uh, pelvic floor and myalgias, <clears throat> pelvic floor involvement, is something that I think we are beginning to understand more of and certainly can play a role in pelvic pain as well as piriformis syndrome, psoas, inflammation. And then finally in the psychiatric realm, uh, I don't think what we mean to say here is that there are psychiatric causes of pelvic pain, but what we do see commonly is that our female patients who present with chronic pelvic pain who've been dealing with it for a long period of time, when we can't determine a cause in any one of these other categories, we tend to, in many cases, uh, put this diagnosis uh, uh, on these patients and call it psychiatric, whether it's uh, depression having to do with any sort of uh, physical or sexual abuse in the form of vaginismus. Um, again, a lot of times we see that folks are placed in this psychiatric uh, diagnosis without having ev uh, evaluated any vascular causes. So when we have chronic pelvic pain, particularly secondary um, to uh, pelvic congestion syndrome, we want to first start with a definition. Chronic pelvic pain is defined as pain that's lasted longer than six months and is non-cyclical. <clears throat> we know that up to 10% of all gynecological consultations that are performed in the office are due to an indication or a, 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 a chief complaint of chronic pelvic pain. About 20% of laparoscopies that are performed are due to a uh, complaint of chronic pelvic pain. And up to 40% of all of these chronic pelvic pain patients can be explained by this idea or concept of pelvic venous insufficiency or pelvic congestion syndrome. So let's talk about signs and symptoms. Uh, we typically will see patients who are multi -parous. Uh, They The description is that after the uh, first pregnancy and subsequent pregnancies, the symptoms uh, continually get worse. Uh, so again, multi women uh, tend to have much more significant symptoms than uh, uh, patients that have never been pregnant. Um, there is not only pain that's described, but also bloating uh, that's described in the pelvis, significant bloating uh, that's not associated with, uh, with the cycle, with menses. One of the things that we hear commonly from patients is, uh, is a complaint of dyspareunia. And in particular, we, we hear from our patients quite frequently that they have postcoital dyspareunia uh, that can last for hours and in some cases even days after intercourse. It's pain that is very commonly described as um, aching pressure type of sensation. Uh, so again, if you have patients that are perimenopausal, postmenopausal, the dyspareunia that you hear described has more of a ripping or tearing sensation 
uh, due to a uh, hormonal lack of uh, lubrication, where the patients who have uh, pelvic pain of more of a vascular origin will describe more of a pressure or even a foreign body sensation that can last for a long period of time. And in fact, um, uh, ironically and, and unique to this, we many times have patients say to us in the, in the exact same words, it feels like there's a bowling ball in my groin or my pelvis uh, that only subsides or over time after I've been laying down. So it leads to, of course, uh, avoidance of intercourse due to the fear of pain. And of course, uh, can lead to intimate, intimacy issues. We do have uh, patients who tell us that they have uh, urinary frequency, especially at night. And this is due to the irritative effect of the blood in the pelvis that's pooling uh, in this venous hypertensive situation. Um, and of course, that bladder irritability leads to that urinary frequency. And we talked about this idea of um, potentially irritable bowel symptoms, uh, not really with the constipation or diarrhea that comes with that, more of just the chronic aching, achy, heavy um, uh, pelvic pain, and sometimes can be uh, described as abdominal. In terms of signs, um, we look for varicosities in what we call unusual locations. So it is not normal to see varicosities in the vulvar region. When we see these, typically they're described as being uh, worse during pregnancy and they may resolve or get better uh, postpartum, but then they'll reoccur with a recurring pregnancy. Uh, vulvar varicosities are really pathognomonic for this disease. And it's something that when a patient describes it to you, you have to think about uh, pelvic congestion uh, or, or pelvic pain of a vascular origin. In addition, if you see suprapubic varicosities, uh, medial thigh, gluteal fold varicosities, and then if you see lateral thigh and lower extremity varicosities, you also want to make sure that you have um, a lower extremity uh, workup for uh, venous insufficiency. At times you'll have patients that uh, will describe to you that they have vaginal edema and their, their GYN provider or their primary care provider who's done a speculum exam may describe a uh, presence of visible varices on speculum exam. Another thing that we have really come to associate with this disease is the presence of hemorrhoids. Again, uh, multigravida women do complain uh, quite frequently of hemorrhoids, uh, but this is another uh, potential sign of uh, an escape vein, and that can lead us to this diagnosis of pelvic congestion syndrome. So what do we wanna do from a diagnostic evaluation standpoint? 100% of our patients that we treat uh, in this uh, pelvic congestion syndrome category have had a gynecological evaluation prior to treatment. And it's of course up to that, that GYN provider as to what evaluation they will provide, but typically it involves transvaginal ultrasound. And many times what you'll see on that report is a finding of cross pelvic or uterine and adnexal venous collaterals. And um, you'll see that uh, in, in a lot of the, uh, uh, the major findings in these reports that you receive from the GYN provider. <clears throat> On occasion, a laparoscopy is uh, performed to rule out endometriosis. And that, of course, is at the discretion of the, the GYN provider. Um, a gastroenterology workup is uh, not needed, but is often done in our experience, which can uh, come in the form of uh, upper and lower GI endoscopy. And sometimes you see uh, folks who come to you with a uh, a CT that's already been done, CT abdomen and pelvis with uh, contrast. And it'll be described in the report, um, if it's described at all, that there's a, a large uh, caliber or diameter ovarian vein. They may describe uh, pelvic varicosities. Um, and sometimes you'll see that uh, in the report, sometimes you won't. When, of course, when you see that, the radiologist is really taking the time to evaluate that. This is another thing that leads us to this uh, potential diagnosis of pelvic congestion syndrome. When the patients come to us, uh, of course, we'll review any imaging that's done uh, prior to our visit. Um, we may have uh, a venous duplex scan that was done prior, uh, which includes a report on ovarian vein reflux and the diameter. Uh, they may also have had a, a lower extremity superficial venous reflux scan which is important information for us to put together uh, uh, to evaluate the whole patient. 
But the thing that we do uh, most importantly is a super inguinal venous duplex scan looking for iliac vein outflow obstruction, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So starting with the, the ovarian vein duplex scan, we want to identify, if at all possible, the left and right ovarian veins. And we're looking for a couple of key factors. Uh, one, of course, we're looking for diameter, as we talked about earlier. In this case, this patient has a left ovarian vein that's identified as about uh, 0.56 centimeters, which is just a little bit uh, more than what we'd expect to see uh, in the average patient. Uh, in this case, uh, the left ovarian vein is identified as being almost 0.8 centimeters, which is a definitely a larger diameter than what is considered normal. Uh, typically, you'll see patients that are multigravida uh, will have larger uh, ovarian veins uh, that are identified on uh, transabdominal ultrasounds or transpelvic ultrasounds. And the other thing that we want to do is always put Doppler on these patients so that we can identify whether the ovarian veins are refluxing. In this case, we do see a significant reflux. When we talk about ovarian vein diameters and the incidence of pelvic congestion syndrome, there is a correlation to uh, uh, ovarian vein size versus this diagnosis of PCS. And so as you can see that as the, uh, the diameter of the ovarian vein increases from five to nine, uh, millimeters up to uh, almost a centimeter, we do see the incidence of pelvic congestion syndrome rise. So there is a good correlation uh, between the two. Now, in terms of treatment considerations, um, going back a little bit in time, uh, in the 1980s, uh, there were actually procedures being performed to ligate the ovarian veins, which was done laparoscopically. Um, the the procedure was performed supine. The patient uh, had a CO2 uh, pneumoperitoneum uh, to induce venous decompression. And of course, that then leads to underestimation of the number of varices and undertreatment. It required general anesthesia, and it was really only done uh, very little. So there's only a few cases that were reported. We know that uh, studies report that residual pelvic pain in women uh, uh, can be treated with hysterectomy or, or has been treated with hysterectomy. Um, and that in the, in the case of women that have had their pelvic pain treated with hysterectomy, uh, mm -hmm. up to 33% of women that are treated uh, have a recurrence of a pain in about 20% of those cases. So in the case of pelvic congestion syndrome, hysterectomy uh, is not curative uh, and doesn't address the, the root cause. So when you have a, a, a patient who comes to you with the signs and symptoms and who has a history of a hysterectomy without any resolution, you have to think uh, pelvic pain of a vascular origin. So then as we move on to treatment considerations and, and the historical treatment considerations, uh, the, the next um, treatment endeavor that was, uh, that was used was embolization of the ovarian veins. And at the time, uh, there were uh, metal coils. So here you see the left ovarian vein, the right ovarian vein, both of them have been embolized with coil embolization that has been left behind. And in some cases, uh, chemical embolization of the ovarian veins was used. So uh, a sclerosing detergent is injected in the vein, which causes um, irritation, causes the vein to essentially close on itself and it's embolized and shut down. And the idea was that if we, <clears throat> if we stop or close these uh, offending, refluxing, uh, large diameter veins, that the symptoms will get better. Um, in this case, uh, we have actually some, uh, some images of vulvar varicosities that were treated with foam sclerotherapy and in some cases even coils. So you see coil embolization. Uh, this looks like it's uh, the ovarian vein. But in this case, you can actually see the refluxing uh, dye, and in this case, sclerotherapy, <clears throat> refluxing into the vulva and the labia. So <coughs> <coughs> the 
one of the first studies uh, performed by Dr. Stephen Doherty in Tennessee, uh, looking at patients with um, pelvic symptoms, uh, symptoms that we've already talked about, included 19 patients. Uh, the mean follow-up was 11 months. Um, and of the patients that were treated, 15 of the 19 patients had complete resolution of their pelvic pain. 14 of 17 of the sexually active patients uh, had complete resolution of the dyspareunia. And of the 15 patients who also, in addition to having pelvic discomfort or having lower extremity uh, pain or edema, 13 experienced complete resolution after treatment. So there is a component of lower extremity symptoms which goes along with the, this disease process. So the conclusion that Dr. Doherty and his team uh, came up with was that a non-thrombotic, so non-blood clot related obstruction of the left common iliac vein or the IVC is an underappreciated cause of pelvic congestion syndrome. So again, this concept of secondary pelvic congestion syndrome. And in his case, venous angioplasty or what we call venoplasty and stenting uh, can provide excellent short-term results for these patients with resolution of chronic pelvic pain and dyspareunia. So venous obstruction should be considered and carefully evaluated in patients presenting with pelvic congestion and treatment of the obstruction alone may solve the patient's symptoms. <clears throat> we also uh, have a uh, publication uh, originally titled iliac vein stenosis and an underdiagnosed, uh, is an underdiagnosed cause of pelvic venous insufficiency and this was from the Center for Vascular Medicine. Uh, and this was published in 2018. And this was the largest uh, sample at the time and remains the largest sample of patients in this, uh, in this uh, realm of research at 227 total patients. You can see the average age was uh, 45 years, plus or minus 10 years. And we divided patients into multiple categories ovarian vein embolization alone, ovarian vein embolization plus venous stenting, stenting alone, venoplasty, which we haven't talked about, but as you imagine, uh, based on the name is the inflation of a balloon inside that uh, uh, iliac vein, uh, plus ovarian vein embolization or just venoplasty alone. And the results are very interesting. They show us that Again, these patients tend to be multigravitative patients. So the average number of pregnancies was 3.36 plus or minus two. Um, <clears throat> and we did see that there were uh, concomitant GYN disorders. So it, it again is very important to make sure that we do have our GYN colleagues on board and working these patients up to ensure we provide um, adequate and comprehensive treatment. But Really the key to the study was looking at visual analog pain scores, both before and after the procedure. So <clears throat> the pre-pain score for these patients uh, on a scale of zero to 10 for visual analog pain uh, was an average of 7.41 plus or minus 1.33. So pretty significant pain um, in the ovarian vein embolization uh, category. And then you see that post-procedure, uh, when we look at the different treatment modalities, this is embolization alone, they didn't have terribly good uh, durable resolution of pain at 3.15 plus or minus 3.1. But when we included stenting plus ovarian vein embolization, so stenting of that common iliac vein, or just stenting alone, so not, uh, not performing the embolization, but just the venous stenting alone, these patients had a very good resolution of their pain. Uh, which was a durable result. So an update uh, on that study, and this is going to be presented actually next week at the American Vein and Lymphatic Society meeting, uh, a study from our, our group at the Center for Vascular Medicine, which is an update, uh, and it's called venous, uh, Pelvic Venous Insufficiency Secondary to Iliac Vein Stenosis and Ovarian Vein Reflux which is treated with iliac vein stenting alone. So again, this concept that embolization doesn't lead to a, a durable, efficacious result, that what does lead to that is iliac vein stenting by itself. And so um, we wanted to determine which lesion is the primary etiologic abnormality, which is responsible for pelvic pain. 
and we wanted to determine whether the role of a pelvic reservoir in patients with combined disease as well as ovarian vein reflux uh, was causative. And this idea of a reservoir is again, these refluxing uh, varicosities in the pelvis holding on to a significant amount of blood in that pelvic hypertension uh, kind of a scenario. So again, uh, the results, a couple of highlights in the results. When we look at uh, using intravascular ultrasound, which is a, the gold standard imaging for this, uh, for this disease is uh, uh, by, measured by placing a catheter inside the vein and taking three-dimensional ultrasound uh, pictures of the vein itself, which we'll see some images in a moment. We can see the average area reduction was about 74.1%, plus or minus 13.1. This is very significant. It's considered in the literature and nationally uh, that anything greater than a 50% area reduction is significant and should be treated if the patient is symptomatic. Um, and then we saw that there was a significant number of patients that did have a pelvic reservoir or a reservoir of blood that was, again, spending more time in the pelvis uh, and refluxing in the pelvis than, than what um, we would expect in a normal patient. So in the study, when we looked at partial or non-responders, when we looked at partial or non-responders, uh, so patients that had persistent symptoms, of the nine patients that had persistent symptoms, the vast majority of them, eight out of nine patients, had the symptom of dysmenorrhea with only uh, partial improvement or no improvement at all. Again, arguing that this idea of chronic pelvic pain uh, should be non-cyclical. And if dysmenorrhea is the primary indication, one should consider hormonal uh, methods to, to manage this dysmenorrhea that, um, again, that's why it's key to identify these patients as non-cyclical pain because they probably will not have a very good resolution if we just treat their vascular causes. But there was only one patient that had uh, uh, persistent dyspareunia and that patient did have partial improvement. Interesting to note that seven of these nine patients had a pelvic reservoir. So again, um, uh, uh, the, the, the cause of uh, these patients with persistent symptoms probably had more to do with the refluxing pelvic varicosities than they did with the, uh, the iliac vein compression. Um, and this is the minority of patients. And again, a combination treatment uh, approach is probably what's appropriate for this small number of patients. Another study published by our group in 2020 um, is what we call presentation patterns in women with pelvic venous disorders. And I think this is kind of interesting because what we look at is decades of life. So 20s to 30s, 30s to 40s, 40s to 50s, 50s to 60s, and in greater than 60 years old, and we see leg symptoms, which are highlighted in uh, blue, and we see pelvic symptoms, which are highlighted in lime green. And what we see is that over time, we have a significant percentage of our patients who present with uh, leg and pelvic symptoms in their early years. But as people, as our female patients age, the incidence of pelvic symptoms go down fairly significantly, but the incidence of leg symptoms increase. So for the patient that you see in their 20s and 30s who's complaining of significant pelvic discomfort and we identify that it, it has a, a cause of pelvic congestion syndrome, whether primary or secondary, uh, one can surmise that untreated, the pelvic pain will uh, improve over time, over decades of life, but it will morph more into leg symptoms, which can be just as, uh, just as confounding as the pelvic symptoms and really important for our pelvic, uh, for our, our pelvic patients to understand. <clears throat> so just a quick uh, case, love to do case histories. So this is patient LM, who is a 37-year-old female, past medical history of uh, anxiety, asthma, ADD, and superficial venous insufficiency. She had lower extremity ablations done in 2018, but she had recurrence of the superficial venous insufficiency. So again, patients who are having lower extremity symptoms, um, they, they uh, first should be treated with superficial intervention if necessary and if required. But if they have recurrence, if they have good treatment and they have recurrence of those symptoms, um, this, is, this is again, 
raise us to the level of significance that we should be looking at uh, uh, super pubic, or I should say, uh, uh, above the inguinal ligament uh, causes for, for the vein disease. Patient also has a history of a spinal fusion, and we'll talk in a second about how that's important. This patient was gravitified pair of three um, with a normal BMI. Uh, medications really not contributory. Uh, her pelvic pain was a six out of 10 daily. Uh, dyspronia was a six out of 10, dysmenorrhea seven out of 10, and she had vulvar varicosities on a speculum exam. Uh, she also was having right uh, lower extremity and left lower extremity symptoms and pain daily and six out of 10 in the right leg, uh, five out of 10 in the left leg. And just of note, uh, the measurements of the common iliac veins, uh, these are both considered to be uh, more narrow than expected. And so therefore uh, a high likelihood that there is uh, compression, uh, particularly in the case of the left common iliac vein, may Thurner compression. And uh, we saw reflux in those, uh, those offending veins as well. So this is her venography. Um, interesting to note, as we talked about, she had a history of uh, spinal surgery with, as you can see, fixation. And um, so again, we've, uh, we've introduced catheters into uh, both the left and right common femoral veins. We're ejecting x-ray dye. And um, it's interesting to note that this spinal fixation, so I've not highlighted it here, but there um, is another paper in the literature also published by uh, our group, the Center for Vascular Medicine, that uh, shows a correlation between uh, common iliac vein stenosis and lower, uh, uh, low spine fixation. And the, the idea is that uh, these low spine fixation procedures and many times are done through an anterior approach. And when the surgeon is uh, providing access, the, the, when the vascular surgeon typically uh, is providing access for the spine surgeon, there is uh, potential manipulation of these common iliac veins, which can ultimately lead to stenosis. And certainly sometimes the placement of the hardware can lead to stenosis as well. So what we saw in uh, the sample that we looked at of our own patients, uh, fully 100% of the patients that had uh, uh, low spine fixation had significant stenosis of the common iliac veins. And while it's not causative, uh, it, certainly, um, it certainly gives us uh, a moment of pause and consideration when we have patients that have uh, had a history of these types of procedures. So again, a bit of a different view and what we're looking at here is the catheter has been introduced into the uh, the left renal vein and down into the left ovarian vein and dye is being uh, injected. And what we're seeing is very significant reflux uh, in the ovarian vein, as well as uh, reflux in the periuterine uh, plexus, this area surrounding the uterus. Again, indicative of pelvic congestion syndrome. So this is the intravascular ultrasound. So as I mentioned, this is the gold standard of imaging uh, when it comes to pelvic congestion syndrome, May Thurner syndrome. And essentially what we have is a three-dimensional view. This is our catheter and this is the vein. And as we introduce the catheter, we start at the IVC and we pull back very slowly so that we can image in a 360 degree view all the way down, uh, all the while taking measurements, looking at morphology uh, as well as diameter. We can also see any um, any uh, thrombus formation, we can see chronic DVT highlighted in these images. And this is really the gold standard that allows us to, to measure uh, and locate the area of stenosis that we think is most significant and causing the patient's symptoms. It is, it is fair to say that it is impossible to provide a quality outcome to our patients without the use of intravascular ultrasound. Just using venography alone in a two-dimensional way is not adequate. Uh, to provide a safe and effective outcome for the patient. So here you can see um, what we've done is we've used the technology and we um, first identify what we call our reference segment. So in this case, the um, proximal uh, left common iliac vein is measured uh, with an area of about 170 millimeters squared, um, which is approaching normal. 
but then the area of interest, which is highlighted by the green outline, is the area of maximal compression. Um, and what we see is that the difference between the two equals uh, what we call area reduction of almost 84%. So in other words, um, there is from the reference segment down to the most compressed segment, a difference in area of almost 84% which again, if you recall from our earlier discussion, anything greater than 50% is considered significant and should be treated if the patient is symptomatic, which of course this patient was. So we treat that in the form of venous stenting. And so you can see here, and I'll let this run a couple times, same patient, you can see the uh, spine fixation um, and you can see uh, this is the uh, distal IVC, this is the right common iliac vein, left common iliac vein, you can see our stent, which um, the proximal portion of the stent has these really nice fiducials. So you can see it's been deployed uh, right at the ostium with the IVC and it extends all the way down into the external iliac vein. Um, this is a more than likely a Venovo barred stent. Um, these are nitinol stents that are um, uh, the state of the art. They are purpose designed for this uh, this part of the, uh, the vasculature and something that um, we've used extensively in our practice. And um, you can again see in our next slide, this is the intravascular ultrasound after uh, the stent has been deployed. So you see the artifact um, of the, uh, the ultrasonic image reflecting off of that nitinol stent. And you can see that we end up with a patent vessel uh, that has significantly less narrowing uh, and we're able to improve the outflow or the drainage and therefore the, uh, the patient's symptoms improve. So uh, follow up on this patient, eight weeks post-procedure, all of her visual acuity uh, pain scores were zero out of 10. And uh, we had our most recent follow-up with this patient uh, about six months after that, um, early part of this year, and she remained symptom-free. Um, important to note that uh, when, you're, when you're dealing with this disease process, follow-up is really important. And we, we think it's very important to follow up with our patients uh, who receive intervention for the remainder of their lives. Um, and um, so I, I think that's a really important factor when you're determining who to refer a patient to, to make sure that they consider this a longitudinal disease that requires uh, continuous follow-up rather than a, a one and done kind of approach. So in conclusion, when it's appropriate evaluated, most patients with pelvic congestion syndrome do have an iliac vein stenosis. So treating the stenosis with or without embolization will lead to better outcomes for pelvic and associated symptoms, whether they're dyspronia or lower extremity symptoms. The short-term results are clearly better uh, we do need intermediate and long-term results uh, to be able to continue to evaluate this appropriately. And that's something that we in our group are, are doing on a continual basis. Um, what have been called traditionally, or the traditional methods, again, in the form of embolization, whether coil or chemical embolization, uh, may soon be historical. As is the case anywhere in medicine, you want the procedures to have done a large number so that they're quite good at uh, what they do and have good outcomes. So happy to help in any way. Folks can call me directly as well. Um, happy to help in you know, um, any way that we can.